Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. After this introduction, I got stress level high. Let's get started. Today, I will talk about machine learning at LinkedIn. And many of my content and slides I borrowed from other talks and blog posts that you can find on LinkedIn. And one of the reasons I'm doing this talk is that this year I've been involved in improving developer productivity for the machine learning folks at LinkedIn. So I want to share the things that I've learned. And also I want to get you excited about machine learning because it's a uh, machine learning, which is to me is AI, it's the same thing, AI or machine learning. It's eating the software. So you're going to get hooked up very soon, like everybody will. Even small companies will have tons of data very soon. Think about all those IoT devices. They all, they are all collecting so much data. We have to process that and reason about it and use statistics and computers to build better products, to drive revenue, right? To make business out of it. So AI will be everywhere and you'll get involved very soon. Companies are also invested in developer productivity. This has been the trend for several years now, but we also see that in machine learning engineering productivity. Yeah? Uh, yes. So uh, this is where I get into the picture because what I do at LinkedIn, I work on developer productivity. That's my goal. The reason I talk about machine learning because I was involved in the project that deals, and that project actually goes on. We really want to improve the productivity for the folks that work with uh, machine learning models. This talk is also for everybody. It's, I'm going to avoid statistics and math and algorithms. I want to stay at reasonably high level. And we should have some time in the Q&A at the end, or you can grab me after the talk and we can dive deeper into some of the topics. I've also noticed that on Wednesday, there's another talk about machine learning where you can get more exposure to specific algorithms and like gentle introduction to like nonlinear models or the deep learning. So check out this talk. Uh, but I do want to know how many of you work with machine learning models. Can you give me a show of hands? How many of you work with machine learning models? Okay. Okay. This small number of you, I think it's about like 3%. And uh, I hope that staying at the high level will be also useful for you. And from all the things that I talked today, I'm going to give you links where you can dive deeper and to find out the exact algorithms or exact strategies that we use, either for solving the business problems or making machine learning productive. OK, so I'll start with a gentle introduction to machine learning based on the milestones that I personally consider very exciting and fun. So those are not the official machine learning milestones. Those are my milestones that I like. This is an interesting case. So and during the World War II, there was this problem that when the planes went out to the battle and they came back, only some of them came back, let's say half of them, right? So the engineers were trying to figure out what parts of the plane to reinforce. And there was data collected. Right? And we found that most of the planes that came back had most bullets in the wings and least bullet holes in engine. Right? So based on that data, which part of the plane would you reinforce? <laughs> you know that story, right? So what they did is they reinforced wing, right? You know, most of the bullets go to the wing. And that did not make any difference because they were looking at the the only portion of the data, only the planes that came back. And the planes that came back actually survived, which is a good thing, right? So look at the engine, right? Because the only, few, only the fewest amount of planes that came back had holes in engine, which, mean, which indicates that the ones that actually got the holes there, they, they were destroyed, right? So when they did the opposite, and they reinforced engine that actually moved the needle and they saw those numbers of planes that were surviving way more. And this is indicative for us because it's really important. The data is really important when you do machine learning. You need to have a good data, good representation. If you don't have a good data, you might draw wrong conclusions and you might also, you, you, you'll find your algorithm not working very well. Another interesting thing I want to talk about is the checkers game in 1959 when Dr. Arthur Lee Samuel at ABM, he creates a program 
and that program plays chess with himself, with itself, right? Program against program. And then over and over, over some time, he's able to come up with, this, with, with the version of that program that is able to beat a respectable human player in checkers. And I find it really, really amazing that like so, it is, it's like 59, so it's like long before I was born, and such an interesting invention um, came to be. What is really, really interesting here is that at the time, the computers were not very strong, right? The memory was really small. So that program couldn't just explore all the possible paths, right? You know, what you can do with that board of checkers. So he had to come up with a different way to, to make that program win, yeah? So what he did, he came up with some basic reinforcement learning where there's a function that, given the state of the board, can evaluate or predict the likelihood of winning, right? And uh, using that, and then he was also mm, tuning that function using the real games from professionals, right? And then he was running this program to, uh, to play against itself. So it's really interesting because he couldn't use like horsepower and just brute force it and identify all the possible mm, paths through the game. He had to come up with a smart way to, uh, to create a winning program. So there, there it was, and it was like very interesting. And then there is uh, 97 where Deep Blue beats Kasparov in chess, very interesting. One of the, the, the conservatives would say that it wasn't really AI, right? Because the program was pretty much brute forcing, like all the, explore all the possible options from this state of the board and figure out what is the best move, yeah? But it's, it's still, to me, it's still seminal because, you know, it, it, what is the, because it changes the canonical game that we, what is the canonical game that we can say that AI is you know, state of the art, right? And that canonical game then moved to the Go game uh, because Go, the complexity of Go is far bigger than chess, which means for a long time there wasn't a computer that could uh, beat a human player until 2016 happened and DeepMind's AlphaGo program happened and that program beat uh, the cur current, the, 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 that time champion, human champion of that game. And this is actually pretty amazing. So the way they have trained that AlphaGo program was more or less traditional supervised learning where you know, you, uh, they evaluated thousands or tens of thousands professional Go games. And this way they were able to train the program to say, you know, given that state of the game, the professional human player would, would, make, would make that move, right? So remember that. And then over and over again, and that's how they've trained that AlphaGo program so that he was able to beat uh, the human player. And if you look at some of the videos or some of the stories around that, it was quite amazing where, like, this, like in one of the games, uh, the program made some amazing creative move that no human would do. And then all the spectators and all the people who were commenting on that game, like, how, why is the computer doing those moves? We had no idea, no human would do it. So it's like interesting and it kind of makes you, makes you think about the future of AI. But w what is even more interesting is that DeepMind, a company that created that algorithm, in 2017 they've created another version of that algorithm and that new version beat the AlphaGo like 100 to zero. Uh, what is interesting is that algorithm works completely differently. Instead of doing this classic supervised learning using the data from professional games, they've created a more sophisticated algorithm and let the program play against itself. Yeah? So it was more, it was a reinforced learning where, uh, where the program starts with a, like a random, with a very low skill and makes random moves. And over time, it plays against itself, becomes better and better and better. And at some point, it surpasses the, the, the previous program. What is also really interesting about that is that it, it shows us that, of course, the data matters for machine learning, but the right algorithm matters even more. Because with this alpha go zero, they, had, they didn't need any data, really, right? They basically let the program play with, with itself. 
And because the algorithm was so sophisticated, they were able to, to create a, a program that is better than the previous version that was winning like 100 to zero, which is pretty amazing. But now, something that I'm sure everybody can relate to. So how many of you either play or have played StarCraft in the past? Okay, that's far more than do machine learning, I think. It's about 30% of you. And like, this is pretty amazing because I couldn't imagine that StarCraft 2 can be a game where you can create a program that uh, beats a human player, especially if you see those human, those human players who play at the professional level. Because those guys are doing like 800 actions per minute, like clicks. So this is, it looks like that. This is like amazing. Some of them play for like, uh, since they were like six years old or something. So those professional players are really, really good. And then StarCraft also is, like at least to my mind, it's much more complicated game than the chess or Go. Because, you know, in the chess, you see the whole board all the time, right? You, there's, you, there's no way to bring a new uh, units to the game. Like in StarCraft, it's different, right? You don't see the entire map. You have this concept of fog of war. You can produce uh, new units, and units are different. And then there are different races that you play against, and those races have different at attributes and special skills. So, and then also the map is not fixed board with a, a limited amount of uh, places, but it's like it's, it's really complicated. So, and also in StarCraft, you have this concept, you have this macro economy where you gather resources and you have micro tactics where you actually uh, are doing a battle with, uh, with, um, with computer or another, a different human. So the complexity is like incredible. And yet, reinforced learning uh, plus uh, deep neural networks, they actually, uh, they were able to come up with a program that beat a human player and they actually introduced to the office, like one of the best uh, Protoss player in the world. He happened to be a Polish guy. Uh, you, can, you can follow those links and check this out. It's very interesting. And the program actually won. Now, th there are a couple of more interesting things about it. Uh, one is that what they've done with this program, they handicapped it a little bit. For example, they've introduced a, a artificial delay between information and action so that, it, so that the computer does not have like a um, some kind of a artificial advantage over a human. They've also limited the amount of actions per minute that the uh, computer program does so that the game is more fair. Uh, of course, you can still say that um, it's not, you know, this, the state of the art is still awaiting, right? It's, there's still more things they can do because they only play on, the, on, this, on one map, so they, they, do, they cannot play on random map. Also, they play only one race. So this program can only, only play Protoss against Protoss. So it's, there's still more to do, but it's still, still very interesting that given the complexity of StarCraft and the professional players, uh, the program with uh, reinforcement re learning can actually beat them. All right, so that's it from the games. I hope this excites you about like this. And this is happening now. This is like 2019. So machine learning and the advancement is like really right now. Let's talk about uh, LinkedIn and machine learning at LinkedIn. We have a number of products, and most of you know LinkedIn.com or your LinkedIn uh, app. Uh, LinkedIn goal, our vision, is to get you the best job. That's basically it, right? The reason I go to work in the morning so that every one of you can get the best job. Uh, in order to do that, there is a set of products. LinkedIn.com is the, most, uh, the, the one that people mostly know, but there are others. Some of them are used by recruiters or headhunters. Some of them by salespeople. Um, and all those products, one of the things they have in common is machine learning is everywhere. Uh, we need that. Like with our scale, without machine learning, we won't be able to make those products good. Uh, for example, feed, like the updates you, you, see, you see at LinkedIn. Like without machine learning, we won't be able to come up with a reliable strategy to provide you the meaningful feed updates so that you are more inclined to use it and uh, read those messages, those information. Same goes for jobs. With the jobs, we want, to rec we want recruiters to, to be able to find the best candidates for given jobs. We want you to find the best job recommendations. 
And we can do that through machine learning and those models, they help us uh, significantly in that. Now I'm going to dive deeper into s those use cases. And each use case that I'll cover, I'm going to stay at reasonable high level, but then there's a Q&A, we can, we can dive deeper. Each of those use cases, th uh, I specifically selected those because there are recent blog posts on the LinkedIn engineering blog where you can dive deeper in each of them, except for the last one, which is anti-abuse and spam detection and this sort of things. Like, it's not super smart to tell how you do your security, like in public, so this is not something we're going to put on our blog. Um, but definitely, we use machine learning there as well. It really helps us. Let's talk about recruiter search first. Recruiter is not a, I don't think that any one of you uses it because it's more for recruiters, but it, it absolutely is, to me, is like a fundamental part of the LinkedIn ecosystem of uh, products. It's because like our goal is to get you the best job, which means we want to get the headhunter or the recruiter the best possible candidates for the job that he's looking for uh, to fill. Yeah? So um, this is like the heart of LinkedIn. And it's, it's complex and important. And let me tell you a little bit about the complexities here. So the, to search those candidates, those queries are complicated. You can fiddle with the parameters of the query. There are different types of queries. That's one complexity. Another complexity is that it is not enough to find the best candidates for the job. We want to find the best candidates who will be willing to actually you know, change their job or react positively to, to an offer or conversation with the recruiter. Because otherwise, it does not make sense. It does not make sense when, you know, to provide search results for the candidates that are amazing for the job, but they will never accept an offer or they are not interested in changing the job, right? So this is, another, uh, this is something that we have to take into con consideration when we perform the searching and then ranking and filtering those search results. Uh, we also have to deal with standardization, right? You know, I can write on my profile that I'm a software engineer, but, you know, there's a gentleman here in the second row, he would write that he's a software craftsman, right? So, like, th there is no standards how people tell about themselves in their LinkedIn profile. So, we need to standardize. And this, there are more and more complexities there. We also have to, in order to maximize the, the quality, sometimes we have to do multi-pass, like we have to do multiple passes through the, through the searching and ranking. And given that, uh, that complexity, we have to apply multiple strategies to, to make it successful. And we did, to give you an example, like in two years, we doubled the number of accepted like emails from candidates which is very nice. And there are like multiple strategies involved. If you like follow that link, um, y you can find out about them. Um, <coughs> recommended job is another example <coughs> where uh, there's one other interesting component here with recommended jobs. Um, I, I don't think we need to know too much about the product. Think about like there are ways at li uh, uh, through the LinkedIn uh, suite of products for, for a recruiter or, or a person to find recommended jobs. And uh, one of the key features there to make that, uh, those recommended jobs relevant and useful is the concept of online learning. Um, so in addition to more traditional um, machine learning models that are involved when, you're, when, you, when, when we're doing searching and finding relevant candidates, we also do online learning. And the way it works is that it parameterizes the way we search for results and provide and, and rank the results based on your active session. So like either, let's say the recruiter is using the tool. So the way he works with the tool and types of candidates he, he's looking for, we will adapt how the queries are done and how the result are pre results are presented so that we can provide most, more meaningful results. So, and that's in, in combination with, with some more traditional models that are, um, that are also taking place, um, which, is, which is very interesting. And then, like, the basic example is that, uh, let's say, a recruiter comes when he makes a query at 9 a.m., right? And then he makes the same query, like, a few hours later, he might get different results based on what he was doing, what was his session, what, kinds of, what types of candidates he was looking. So that's a really powerful uh, tool. 
um, there's also a LinkedIn salary um, product, uh, which is very important. Think about it. Like, the, the salary or compensation is one of the most important factors when we are looking for a job or evaluating job offers, right? So if LinkedIn can provide you an accurate information about salary, that's super useful to making good decision about, about your next play. And, but the problem with salary is that this is sort of a, you know, some people don't feel inclined to share the salary. Of course, the way, and then at LinkedIn, the way it works is that members um, voluntarily submit their salary information. Of course, we don't keep it, uh, we don't tie it with, with a particular person. We keep, we keep only an aggregate number so that we can accurately serve the community. Um, but, the, but because we don't, have data, we don't have representative data from all the like, millions of companies throughout the world, it's really hard to provide you the accurate number. Fortunately, like, statistical tools are great when your data is sparse. So the intuition that we are using here is that if there are two companies, A and B, and we see like, migration of employees from one, co somewhat equal migration of employees from one company to another, we assume that those companies have probably similar salary, right? Because you probably don't go, you, you, you know, you won't be going to the company if they, if they lower your salary, typically, right? So that's the basic, basic intuition. And if we, if we model that intuition into, the, into, the, uh, into a machine learning model, plus add some other like, statistical tools around it, we can provide great coverage for all the, mm, for, uh, for the companies. We don't really have exact specific information about salary. And that, that's working really well for us as well. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the help search page where we facilitate neural networks and deep learning. And the way it works is that LinkedIn has uh, over 600 million members now. And then sometimes folks don't know how to do certain things on the site, so they will go to the help page and you know, they will read something, but if they don't find useful information, they will just contact the support. And that's not really good experience if you have to contact support. Right? Moreover, it's costly for us because there has to be a human to answer that uh, support request. So uh, what we do is we invest it into like, automatic ways of um, providing that help. And then we, c we have good results from some standard algorithms that do text mining, right? We can analyze the text, we can find similarities and figure out that, hey, for that question, those are the articles that most likely help the person. However, for some kind of edge cases and some questions that are, uh, sometimes users would type those questions in a sort of awkward ways using not like we weird vocabulary, and it's, we are not getting, they're not getting good results, right? So this is where neural networks are super useful and the concept of deep learning. And on the high level, those this category of uh, algorithms, they work in a way like neuron work, work in our brain, right? And if using those category of algorithms, we find it, uh, we finally can find similarities between articles. We can find intent, we can, we can co correlate the intent of the query with the intent of the article and actually provide the, the correct articles, uh, help articles for the user and he can find the answer he's looking for. All right, so let's zoom into the um, AI workflow at LinkedIn. On the high level, like everything starts with the product. So we have a vision of LinkedIn. We want you to get the best job possible. And product managers, engineers, and executives, like entire company works and, and designs like what the product should be doing, right? Once we have our true north, our, our goal, our vision, we can go into metrics, yeah? We, the metrics help us to identify whether we are moving the, evolving the platform in the right way. Are we, are, you know, all those features that we're building, are they moving us to the right direction or not? When we have metrics, and then this, this famous, like, quote that we always use at LinkedIn is, uh, you can only fix what you can measure, right? So you have to measure in order to fix. So measure, 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 being like uh, data-oriented is very important. We go to machine learning framework where we can, 
work, like we, we can have an idea for the, for the model, we can then train that model, we can then deploy it to production, and that happens within that machine learning framework that I'll talk more about. And then, what is really important, we will be using our A-B testing framework or experimentation framework to find out if that model or that update to a model is moving the metrics the way we want to see them moving. Yeah? And this is really, really important for working with those, uh, with, with the data mo with, with those models. The reason is important, and I will make a parallel with the classic software engineering. So in classic software engineering, the feedback between, you know, you write some code, and you can run the unit test right away, and you can test the feature right away. So the feedback is really short. It's y you're seconds away or minutes away from testing your change or seeing your change working. And that's completely not the case for, um, for machine learning, because there, you, only, you work with an idea, right? Okay, well maybe I tweak the algorithm this way. I'm going to quick tweak those parameters this way, and I'm going to train it, and, it, and you're training it, and it looks good, so I'm going to try it in production, right? Um, but th those, this, this feedback loop is much longer. It's not seconds and minutes, not at all. Um, and also, you have to, like, to, to be absolutely sure that this is working and it's, and it's uh, bringing value, you have to... Draw, you have to eventually deploy it to production and through the experimentation framework compare, right? Okay, with that new version of the model, am I getting the better numbers than with the previous, um, with the previous model? And to give you like, the, like a good example for that, think about our, I talked about search, like recruiter search, where we search and we find candidates. Uh, one of the metrics we can see is with the new model, right? are we getting more clicks on the first result, right? This is something we can completely automatically check. Um, because typically these days when you search for anything, you're looking at the first result, right? That's how you use Google. That's most and then this is a good indicator. If the recruiter is more likely to click on that first result, it means he's getting meaningful results uh, from the search. So that's, that's one of the metrics. And then, you know, you, you, you can have m different metrics around it as well. Um, but using that metrics, we can actually find out if the, if the new model is helping with the search results. All right, some of the machine learning opportunities that we see. There's, there are a lot of technologies. The state of the art is really advancing quickly. Like it's maybe not as years ago, there was this saying that yeah, yet another day, yet another JavaScript framework, right? Um, today, it's, it's different, um, but definitely you can see that within machine learning, you see startups coming up really quickly where they offer like end-to-end -end, um, machine learning frameworks for your company to, you know, to bring it in and you're served like end-to-end. -end. Um, we see new technologies, we, we see rapid advancement. So um, it is hard to, being a part of a big company like LinkedIn, it's hard to, you know, put your bets on single framework and then basically hope that this framework will be like forever useful and uh, best. Um, this is something that introduces a challenge. Um, what it means for us is that we have to architect for extensibility, right? We cannot be too opinionated to work with a specific framework uh, because down the road where a next framework comes along or some other uh, technology that is useful for machine learning, we are not able to nimbly adopt to it, right? So that's, that's a very important thing about like architecture. And also we want to be able to leverage like existing standard technologies, right? Um, and this is very interesting balance that we have to uh, make because on one way we want to have environment where approach to standard use cases is standardized across the LinkedIn engineering. Like we have a couple of thousand engineers so um, what happens is, like, it's helping us if, like, approach to certain use cases is standardized. Let me give you an example for, let's say, Java microservices. Like, I want to have at LinkedIn one way of developing Java microservices. I don't want to have, you know, each team is bringing a new framework because, you know, it's fun. Um, same goes for machine learning. Like, I, I want to have standardized ways of doing uh, things like training models and deploying those models to production regardless of what particular technology or algorithm this model is uh, leveraging, yeah? 
So on one way, we do want to standardize. On the other way, we can't, we can't lock in. We cannot just say, uh, come up with a, a fixed architecture that basically forces you to use certain framework. We, s uh, we still want to be able to be open for innovation. Um, but we have to strike this great balance. So it's really important to, to come up with the good architecture and architect for extensibility. Another interesting challenge or opportunity is that typically those models, they sit in the mission critical um, products. For example, like I talked about search, recruiter search. Um, if there is something wrong with our machine learning infrastructure, for example, you cannot deploy a new version of a model to production. You cannot uh, get the necessary inputs for the model, features for the model uh, during runtime. If those things are broken, like we cannot serve the fundamental functionality, which is like searching for, uh, for candidates, which is fundamental uh, feature that, that we offer to, to our customers. And we are basically failing to deliver our vision, right? So uh, most of the time, those machine learning component, the components, they sit within the uh, critical path for the really critical systems. This means that we really have to architect it well. We cannot really go fast and just, hey, let's experiment, let's do this, let's do that, right? We have to, for, for the infrastructure, for the machine learning infrastructure, it has to be state of the art, it has to be very safe. Machine learning is also being democratized. And maybe you can see that also, that it's not only this sort of small group of scientists that sit in the corner somewhere and they, those are the only guys who deal with machine learning. It's, it's becoming something that is used throughout the entire company. We see that in the old product groups. I also see that within you know, my group, and my group is um, you know, like foundation group for, we build tools for engineers, we, we improve developer productivity for all engineers at LinkedIn. Uh, and this is very interesting. This is, this is one of the reasons I'm doing this talk because my prediction is that you will be involved with machine learning at some point. All right, so I want to dive into this project that I was part of uh, at LinkedIn. It's called Productive Machine Learning or ProML. The reason we launched this project about two years ago is that we wanted, we, we wanted to see more productivity within the machine learning ecosystem. We found that there were certain things that were not like super fast for machine learning guys. And then also we find, found that for certain bottlenecks with productivity, teams were coming up with different workarounds for those problems. And that's not good for like standardizing how you, how you approach common use cases, right? We believe that working with machine learning models is common enough that we want to standardize across our uh, all technology stacks that we support at LinkedIn, all the product teams. Okay, so we had to figure out what is the machine learning productivity. So for us, this is coming from an idea, so maybe you read a research paper, to impact. An impact meaning that you have rolled out that model in production and you now can see that it's moving the, the business metrics. And now we want to iterate, like do it all over again, all the time, very often, and make it also quick. So that, that transition from idea to impact, make it also quick. Don't make it months like quicker, much quicker. And then if we zoom into that a little bit more, we get, we come from idea and then we do more research, research papers, analysis, like how, we, how are we going to design this, um, this algorithm. Then we have offline experiments. And by offline, I mean that they happen, you know, let's say in the background, right? Let's say they happen overnight where you experiment, where you run your training sessions with, with some portion of production data. And only some of those offline experiments, they, they make their way for, uh, further, right? Some of those, they would, uh, they would not be successful. They, we, we would not see sufficient improvements over the base models. Then there is model deployment, which we want to have standardized also fast, right? We want that deployment to be really quick. Uh, and also going to the online experiments where, again, with the online experiments, we can see only portion of those experiments actually successful, moving the metrics the right way. And then if that happens, which is great, we ramp them to, to we ramp them fully to everybody. And th there you go, we have, the, we have the impact we desire. How exactly we measure that productivity? That was like an important thing that we had to figure out. So 
our true north is number of successful online experiments. Like successful meaning that it gives good, uh, the metrics are good, which means that we're going to ramp it up fully, right? So it stops becoming, it's no longer an experiment, it's part of the system, right? Um, because in having only one metric for true north, uh, not super useful. It's useful to also have like signpost metrics or like more low level metrics. That, and then like absolute number of offline online experiments or failure rate of duration of every of the, of the step of those activities also we found it useful and we are tracking them how engineers spend their time we find that you can divide any time that machine learning folks um, are um, what they are doing on a daily basis some of that is routine work and some of that is innovation we want to maximize innovation. Like one of the best ways, really short, like make that routine work really small. Like even, let's say in this example is 50-50. If I half the routine work, I'm gonna have 25% routine work and 75% 75, 75 innovation. It's pretty good. That's pretty amazing. It, we, this, this really helps with, the, with productivity. So that's the strategy that uh, we can do. And you can easily plot it to a standard engineering where in standard engineering you would have also, you know, routine work that you have to do because that's the way to put your stuff to production. It's not really useful work. It's not really, well, I mean, it is useful, but it's not, not, it's not really innovation or like cranking features. It's, it's basically the, the, the rot. Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to reduce that routine work. And it starts with feature engineering. So with all those like activities in the life cycle of the machine learning model, there is feature, feature engineering comes first. Uh, let me talk more about it. And uh, so for those of you who don't know machine learning very well, like features are like inputs to your models. So if you think about the model as a function, features would be like inputs to that function. And um, feature engineering is important because it takes significant amount of time when, when, people, when uh, engineers work on models. And I remember that uh, in uh, last month, there was a conference, o OPML in, in Silicon Valley, there was a panel, and there were like folks from um, Google and Facebook and, and others, uh, LinkedIn as well, talking how they do machine learning. One interesting thing from, that I've learned from Facebook is that they have calculated that all of that whole process of working with a model, 60% of that time is feature engineering. So that's like a significant, significant time. And um, one of the solutions to that is to have a good way to share features, right? So features sometimes can be some canonical uh, basic features, but some of them can be really, really complicated. Um, and also, you know, like wh when, you tr when you run your training runs, when you, when you execute models, you can generate, um, you can do future, uh, feature generation as well. So it's really important to share those features, to be able to discover the features, to be able to um, maintain them within a system. Um, this is very important. Like to make a parallel to more standard software engineering, you can think about, like, think about it as sharing code, which means that it'll have similar challenges with sharing code, right? If you share code, that's awesome, but you know, and then, but at some point you have to do a major version change, which can be a breaking change. So you have to figure out who's going to own the, the cost of that, right? If you have to, or, or like, what if there are some upstream issues with that? With, like, all those pr problems with sharing code, they would also apply to uh, sharing features, but it's uh, very important because of the time that it takes for the feature, features to be engineered. Um, the next part if, is model creation. And there, um, a couple of systems and tools that we use I want to talk about is uh, Quasar is like a, our internal tool for um, executing models, right? And um, it, we found the DSL to be the best format for this. So this is, we came up with an external DSL that can accurately describe uh, a model and it's reasonably flexible to support different, you know, different kinds of algorithms and technologies. And that this is something that we found most useful to achieve a standardized inference library that we can use across LinkedIn. Um, another example 
is we want to leverage some of the tooling that is often used in machine learning. So like Jupyter Notebook, which on the high level is a, it's a web app for you know, sharing and executing code, like typically Python code that's very popular with Python. And um, it found, Jupyter Notebook found it, uh, it became really popular within the machine learning um, community. And uh, we also want to make it integrated uh, with, with our tools. So we want, we want a good experience with using Ju uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And um, yeah, and it also we want to we wanna be able to leverage the tools, right, that are out there, that uh, are already popular. At the same time, we have to be careful not to couple ourselves too much with, with, with those tools. Um, Gradle plugins are also useful for model creation. Um, the way we train our models is um, we use Apache Hadoop and we use Azkaban as a uh, system for scheduling and batch execution of uh, Hadoop jobs. Those are like open source tools. So uh, in order to like send your, like do machine model training, you would have to, you would have, to, you would have some kind of a project with a Gradle plugin and you would create some kind of a package that would be an Azkaban package so that you can execute um, on Hadoop. And Gradle plugins play a big role there because we would be using the Hadoop DSL and all those goodies to uh, make it as easy as possible to um, uh, create those packages, to send those packages out for training. And this is where Gradle helps. Um, there's also model deployment, very important part of the, of the activities you do when you work with the model. The tool that we found useful uh, uh, that we are building is a model explorer. So once models are trained, we want to be able to browse them and find them and discover them. And we also want to be able to quickly deploy them to production. And also I want to mention a very important thing is that we do want to separate the model deployment from code deployment. Um, this is very important because traditionally like we have, we had some teams at LinkedIn that would, that was a very natural thing to do, where you, your model like ships with the code, which means that if, if you have updated a version of that model, let's say you, you run your training and you have new coefficients or you have like some update, like you would have to update the application and basically create a new version of the application, the whole application. And in that example, the model is part of some online service, let's say. And that's not desired, because uh, what you want to have is uh, decouple those things, right? You want to be able to, okay, you have online uh, service, it's, it's already running in production, and, may, and you want to uh, uh, and you wanna use it with a different model, it's nice if you can do it without redeploying your application, right? Because if you redeploy your entire application, then you have to, you know, what if some other changes are getting in? What if there are new dependencies, right? So you have all that complexity that comes with the, uh, with application deployment, also coupled with your with you testing a new model, right? That's undesired. It, it is also similar to this separation of model deployment for, from code deployment. Um, it's also similar to a concept that you might you might be doing in your company for more like standard engineering, which is you separate your um, feature deployment from uh, from code deployment. If that makes sense, so. Let me give you an example from LinkedIn. So uh, standard software engineering at LinkedIn, someone works on the web app, yeah, linkedin.com web app. Uh, and let's say he works on some front end feature. Like all that work, all those code changes, they would be wrapped within this experimentation framework. So that when, when that engineer ships that to production, that new version with these changes that he made, like nobody sees those changes yet. He has the toggle and through the experimentation framework, he can start showing that new feature to a larger population, right? To, and this mitigates the risk. This enables us to go to do continuous delivery because, because of the risk mitigation. So it's very, very useful. And for standard software engineering at LinkedIn, like the closer you are to the end customer, right? Let's say you develop some front end or the mobile app, like most of the changes, if not all the changes would go, would be under that rigor of uh, experimentation framework. And that's how we achieve the separation of feature push from code push. So this is some, somewhat similar with this uh, machine learning and the model, de uh, model deployment where we wanna be able to 
dynamically in runtime application is fine, it's running, but we want to test the new model. We need to be able to do that. All right, and uh, for model maintenance, uh, I, one tool that I want to mention is a Third Eye, which is our standard monitoring platform that allows us to be data driven and yet being able to identify anomalies, right? So like if there are some changes that are happening, we want to get notified. We want to we wanna be able to react quickly and this to us is part of the model maintenance. The primal project at LinkedIn is like work in progress. There's like a lot of things that we need to do. Mm, but on the high level, this is to reduce the complex workflows to like simple configs and make machine learning first class citizen in like LinkedIn tooling because that wasn't the case. Like uh, most of the tools we have built, they were tailored for more traditional software engineering, right? Say for microservices, for mobile uh, apps development. And um, machine learning is something that we have been discovering in the past couple of years. And we identified some gaps that, you know, that when you work with machine learning models, you're not as fast, right? You, you wait too long to test your changes. So we really, w for us, it's like super important to make this, uh, to make uh, working with mach uh, machine learning models mm, as productive, as fast as possible. Some of the other things that we do is we accelerate the democratization of, um, of machine learning across LinkedIn. And the data org at LinkedIn, they came up with those classes. There, there's a very, very interesting curriculum and anyone at LinkedIn can sign up and go through those classes. And what is really nice and unique about those classes is that although they talk in general about machine learning and algorithms and how we do stuff, they are also grounded within LinkedIn, within the tools, within how we do stuff, which is very, very useful and important. And I'm personally a big fan of this formal training within the companies. So as your company grows, and maybe you already have a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand people, what happens is I find it very valuable for the internal workshops, internal training to be happening within the company. So that's, that will help a lot you and the culture in your organization and the, the propagation of knowledge. That would be great. Also, mm, for other mm, things that are not covered within that curriculum, there's LinkedIn Learning. And uh, LinkedIn Learning, you can find courses on everything, everything that I was talking today, including you know, TensorFlow, deep learning, all kinds of stuff. So it's very useful. Um, one of the important things for adoption that we want to be cautious about is a success trap, which is, a th how many of you heard about success trap, by the way? Some of you, no? A little bit, some of you, okay. So this, this, this happens when you are so happy, you're making, uh, uh, there are actually a couple of ways to get into success trap. I'm gonna talk about one a success trap that becomes a support trap. It happens where you have such a great, th you came up with a beautiful product or a feature and then you are amassing customers. You, get, you are onboarding more and more customers and you are past the threshold where this is the amount of customers that you can actually maintain. So the support now is taking more time than you can, you can uh, allocate. Uh, you don't have engineers to work on innovation, to work on like the new stuff. Like you have to put everyone on the support in order to serve those customers. And eventually those customers will be underserved because you don't have time to innovate, right? You, you, only, uh, you only are able to support. We want to avoid that. Uh, and then there are ways to avoid that. Uh, one way to avoid that is to like very rigorously plan and only onboard gradually new customers, like really understand the support you're getting, the, the amount of support you're getting into if you generally announce some beautiful feature and then, and then you have a bunch of people, other teams using that feature. Um, one other way that we have found at LinkedIn at some, uh, sometimes is that sometimes we do have to make hard decisions to fire some of our customers and you can tell them, hey, I mean like, you know, I know that you onboard it and it's great, but we can't really support you at this point. So can you stop using this library technology? Sometimes that happens, sometimes we have to do it. It's, it's a hard call, uh, but it's one way to, to do. Um, yeah, I, that was, this is my last slide. Um, all the links are there, so that presentation will be shared. 
And I have 40 seconds, maybe I can have one question. Some of you, no? I don't know if we do, if we do Q&A. Anybody, any questions, any questions, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Huh? <laughs> Where things are stored for machine learning? Where is the data stored? Oh, so um, Hadoop, HDFS, those technologies, this is what we use typically. And then it sort of depends. We have different kinds of databases. So for certain, certain pieces of data, they would be in the standard databases or in key value stores, depending what particular thing you're talking about. But like, it will be a breadth of technologies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right.